defense. Now Burrow off the play fake. He's going to let one fly. Oh, he's got him wide open. And strolling in for the touchdown is Tyler Boyd. They lose no stop. They keep going. They lose no games. Yeah, they keep going. Why run the ball and you can thunt? Yeah, George tries to unload it his bag, but at least we got to say we're number one Bengals, we're number one pockets, we're number one Bengals, we're number one pockets, we're number one Bengals, we're number one podcast. Slap, slap, we're number one Bengals, we're number one pockets, we're number one Bengals, we're number one pockets, we're number one Bengals, we're number one podcast. Got Bridget, Daddy, O, and Hoji. Eli Sour Apple within the focus. Four and three. I said not all of our rollers got dirty birds in my cup. Now watch me forward. Free wide sell. Now what are you doing? Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm so hard. My nose bleeding. John, that was. Where have you up. been all my life? Just, just to say, that was the best thing she's ever heard. Oh, hey, Matilda. She left. She, she stopped looks, playing. She looks with happy. Her, she stopped playing with her toys, so I, she could I, come I, check that out. Can wow. I just? Can I just explain what happened? Last week, John said, "If the Bengals win." He will not only rap, but he will rap in the style of whatever that the fans want to hear. Yeah. And John, who, specifically who's Atlanta. Yeah. At, of Atlanta rappers. Atlanta rappers. And so that is how talented this guy is. And he yeah. never shared that with us. He no, just he never took that us. style and turned it into a Bengals rap, like on the spot. Like we did this five minutes ago. That's incredible. I was more impressed with his than either of yours. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. Well, I know one okay. of you is a uh, a musician, but we, damn, we, John, that was good. Were. That yeah, was that good. That was really good. That was very good. Welcome to the Number One Bengals Podcast. I'm your host, Daddy McDook. I'm joined as always by Dr. Roger, Dr. Kismoji, John yeah. Sheeran, and Bridget the HR, Jan Cars. And guys, Cincinnati Bengals have won four of the last five games. Joe Burrow is playing at the highest level we've ever seen. Shall we the call it offense, a comeback? I mean, this is beyond a comeback. This is a level in terms of the offense of consistency. That I don't know if we have ever seen from this team before. Yes, we saw some blowouts against the Ravens and the Chiefs and a few other teams last year. But they are operating almost exclusively. The last two weeks, only six real plays were not out of shotgun. And they're finding tremendous success. The running game, okay, not incredible. But the passing game is virtually unstoppable. Did you listen to the song, man? Why run the ball when you can throw it? Why run exactly. the ball? Exactly. It's kind of the song. Do we even need to have the show now that we've had the song? I did no other prep aside from that, so I hope you guys are good for this. No, that was basically yeah. you've done your job, yeah. John. I mean, but, if the Falcons have the third best rush offense and only score or only rush 107 yards to our 78, but we can still get the ball in the air for what 481 yards run the ball enough great but if you've got that clean pocket and you can throw those dimes i'm not super worried about it you know what's funny is because like atlanta exclusively wanted to run the ball and they had the most success throwing the ball it wasn't just Marietta taking the top off of eli apple at the end of the second half like they weren't terrible throwing the ball down the field but they only dropped back 13 times and when you're down two scores for most of the game, it's a recipe for disaster. It, it made no sense to me, but the Bengals just took advantage. They really did. Advantage is the right word. They, they, they looked dominant, which, as Daddy said, this is not really something we even saw last year. It's really been a, quite a change and a, and a welcome one. Yeah. Though, though I, yeah. I would agree that I don't think we can call it a comeback. I mean, the one thing that has bothered me is that people have been counting them out when even but, if you watch the early games this season, there were glimmers of all of this. Even if you yeah. watch the Pittsburgh game here's, that they lost, here's they the lose thing. that. I mean, that was such a freak game. Sure, sure. And that, that two, two field goals that just kind of don't make it when they should have. Right. It was a crazy but day. The people, people don't understand what this franchise is becoming. So when you say the 0-2 oh, start, how many teams have made the playoffs are 0-2 oh, start? Oh, this, that, whatever. There are all the problems. They don't understand. None of that logic applies to this team led by Joe Burrow with a receiver who has great chemistry and, you know, a, a playmaking defense, very a smart defensive coordinator. None of that applies because their ceiling is so much higher than I would say, I'm going, okay, I'm going to say maybe the Bills, you know, maybe could have more talent, maybe the Chiefs, I don't know, maybe. But their ceiling is so high 
that we all, I don't want to say we all knew, I knew, a lot of people seem to doubt, once they figured it out, they could, you know, go for five, six wins in a row and make up for that early deficit. People were, people were comparing them to average teams or yeah. struggling teams. Most of the time when a team comes back from the Super Bowl and it struggles, it's because of injuries. It's because the players got older all of a sudden. It's because of, yeah, there's, but none the of Rams. that applies to the Bengals. Yeah. The Rams. It's when it was a fluke. And in the Rams' case, it was a fluke. And in the Bengals' case, it wasn't. What I noted about this game, and to me, it has always been the most important number in any game. There are two numbers that matter. It is 29 versus 13. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the Bengals had 29 first downs while the Falcons had 13. And when I'm watching a game and I see first down after first down, I know that that team is going to win. I know it seems obvious, but I think that if you make that your focus, and the Bengals seem to have, then it goes better. Of course, the yards matter. They had a lot of passing yards, as John said. They did, there was a lot of other stuff. The offensive line is finally coming together. I get it. But to me, the big factor is, can you get those first downs, conversions, right. especially on I mean, third down? Yeah, I mean, for me... What I took away from this was I don't think Joe Burrow has ever been more comfortable. Joe Burrow has been hot. Joe Burrow has had Jamar Chase destroying secondaries, and they didn't know how to counter it. You know, Joe Burrow has had his moments. Joe Burrow has, let's say, gotten out of danger and made plays down the field. But Joe Burrow has never looked no. so calm no. back there. No. In the pocket. No. Yeah, Bridget. It, no. it reminds me a little bit of Kansas City's start last year. Do you remember yeah. at this point or maybe a couple weeks earlier in the season last year, all of the morning sports shows were Patrick Mahomes is broken, Patrick Mahomes is broken, and the Chiefs came out and had an incredible season. Now, granted, we beat them twice, and I would say we had a more incredible season, but folks wanted to count the Chiefs down and out, and with a 17-game season, I think if you're making these predictions after two games, after week two, I, I feel like people are too short-sighted. Two games yeah. doesn't tell you yeah. enough Again, of anything. Though, it, depend, it depends the on the team, though. It depends on, for me, it depends on the team, the nature of the team. But going back to the point of Burrow, it's, I just it's always to, people with daddy issues coming at Zach. Weren't the, the Lions yeah. one and one at week two? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I want to say, I want to show this play. It was probably my favorite play of the well, game. I thought we were yeah. just describing plays from that one. Don't describe the play. Okay. So Joe Burrow was under pressure, and he just casually rolls away from the pressure yeah and everybody on twitter including myself thought that he was throwing it away he right. just kind of flings it but he doesn't yeah john, yeah. john is acting it out yeah, yeah. and then like, joe mixon like 15 yards down the field he catches it and he, he gets 22 yards and joe burrow not only flings it but then he kind of like turns away you know kind yeah. of like stephen curry when he like shoots a three and he turns it was like that yes and it was the combination of him not taking the pressure very, not worrying about the pressure, and then knowing exactly where he's going with the ball, and, and yeah, and it was. And if I remember correctly, he steps up into the throw, right? Well, he was Probably. kind of fading away a little bit, but that throw is so inadvisable for ninety-five percent of quarterbacks because he's throwing across his body, across to the other side of the field, and he knew that he could make the throw because. There were two trailing defenders who were running behind Mixon who were also running towards Burrow because he was scrambling out of the pocket. He didn't. No one thought that he was going to be able to make a throw down the field. And so he knew that there was space and a window for him to just level the ball over those defenders who had no chance of making the play. So he made not an impossible throw, but a throw that every coach in America would be like, do not make that throw. But he could do that because he knew throw? where the defenders were. Yeah, just, throw, just show uh, why the, don't you not? the throw. Why don't you not? Yeah. Because we have been told... Like, look at this. Like, there, there are defenders near Mixon, but they're all looking at Burrow because no one is expecting that throw to be made. So the fact that he could find that window there and just put it right in Mixon's arms, like, he no. was on one yesterday. I, I like, the, the, one, the, the, the one that Tyler Boyd, where Boyd made that one-handed catch, that is oh, an insane no. catch because Boyd is expecting, catch. he's expecting that hit to be made. I mean, this, this throw was good, too. It was a back shoulder off of a slot fade. Like, the timing of these were impeccable, and I think yeah. it does speak to the comfortability there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, it was the whole game, you know, I saw Burrow just, he's very relaxed in the pocket. 
and, 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 and like the other games, you know, even last year, it was like four or five explosive plays. This game, John, he threw for almost 500 yards. Let's be honest. If he needed to, he could have thrown for 600 yards. Yeah. Well, that, sure. that was actually That's what I was going to ask. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So there's like 30 seconds left on the clock in the fourth quarter. They could have scored. Was it just out of the kindness of their own heart that they need? They were like yeah. on the five. Yeah, you don't. I, I wanted them to get another touchdown. Why not? hates the Falcons, you know? But why not, why not intimidate the Browns? Like next week we're coming for you. I, th- I, think, I think they're more than intimidated at this point. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I say anything. intimidate them more. It's Monday Night Football. It's a big deal. Well, you know. Uh, so one of the time. things I want to say, yeah. though, about. So, yes, Joe Burrow was way more comfortable. We saw him making the throws that we saw him make last year. But, you know, everyone was trying in the first you know, couple of losses. Oh, it's play calling. Oh, it's Joe Burrow's not the same. So what? here's what I think we saw. We saw Joe Burrow comfortable in making calculated and aggressive throws. We saw receivers who were getting open, running routes. We saw Chase have that amazing TD and double coverage in the corner of the end zone. We saw relatively good play calling. I will say I didn't like the going on it on fourth down where we did. I would have liked a field goal. But where you were in the game, I don't think that was game ending. And, right, you call a different play on the go for, and I think something different happens. And then we saw the defense continuously stop either the third down conversion or just make critical plays. And no no points scored in the second half. What I think we all have to see is that there were different phases of this team that all were working together at a more optimum level. And for me, this was validating my own hubris because I was like, it wasn't just one component. It wasn't just play calling. It wasn't just Burrow. It wasn't just receivers. It wasn't just mix in. So I think this was a pretty exceptional game for all three phases and on both sides of the ball for us. That's the culmination of the vision that this whole project was. It was putting together a completely new offensive line that took time to actually gel and communicate with each other. And we saw the fruits of that labor into place last week against the Saints when that first, you know, consistent offensive game happened. And now you had an Atlanta defense that was down basically every single one of their competent players except for defensive tackle Grady Jarrett, who did get into Burrow's face a couple of times. But it wasn't just last year where it, the offense was so reliant on explosive plays and converting third downs. They were converting first downs and first down and second down. They were consistently generating positive plays, not yeah. just with deep balls to Tyler Boyd or to, jo- or to Jamar Chase down the sidelines. They were moving the ball at a consistent pace, which is the exact argument against the regression talk that w- – populated this season yes. is how can the Bengals replicate what they did last year they don't have to they can't they because that to. wasn't sustainable they do better they now have a more dependable they do better. John, 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 you know I want one question one quick question John you mentioned the way you described it and I loved it is that there was a kind of architecture that we're seeing play out this season and things are finally gelling who deserves credit for that if not Zach Taylor doesn't Zach Taylor, the head coach, finally deserve credit? Why is it that when this team loses, everybody is quick to blame Zach? But now that they win, it's all about Joe Burrow. I love Joe Burrow. He is the face of this team. He's the heart of this team. But the brains, that's Zach. That's also Joe Burrow. But I just want to say this. You can't quick. just make a statement like that. I was asking John. John I was talking to John. John, <laughs> to that point, though, people talk about the play calling. Look, we knew the play call. You made a good point, I think, last week, how they were trying to be, you know, on passing downs, they're trying to be LSU Joe Burrow. On running downs, you know, they're under center, which was the Callahan, all this different influence. Sorry, I have some live music. Uh, they're warming no, up. I enjoy my favorite kind. Yeah. That could have been limiting their potential as a, you know, in terms of play calling. So we weren't seeing it. And so now we saw, John, this play that Mike Santagata pointed out where the receivers were, uh, I think, scissoring here, he says, if you watch the play. No, you don't. I'm sure that's not what they said. 
John. S- scissor. Believe it or not, that is a scissors concept. Yeah. No, you do yeah. not call that scissor. <laughs> and I so, think it needs a new new. But well, no, if but that's the route, if, if that's the route, and you need an action verb, like I right. think, yeah, that People makes sense. People wanted no. creativity. They wanted us to be bold. They it wanted us to try scissoring. new things, and that is what we saw in that play, was scissoring. I mean, it doesn't get any more bold and creative than that. And John, we also saw splicing or something. You gotta use it. We saw John. We saw the receivers working in tandem to free up runners. Very good cohesion, like this triplets block here, John. Just trips. No, no triplets. Triplets block. Yeah. This game reminded me. I don't know if it, about you guys, but it reminded me so much of the Ravens game last year at home when the Ravens were down their entire roster too, and Burrow was just as comfortable and poised in the pocket as possible. He was just making accurate, precise throws from a clean pocket or whether it be on the run. And what do you know? He almost had the same amount of yards as he did in that game. And it goes in hand, not only the play calling, but just execution as well. And I think when you when you have a, a clear plan about how to, to attack coverages, when you put in the work and practice and you see the exact looks that you're preparing against, against a defense that just doesn't have the firepower to match you, this is – this is what the Bengals offense looks like at its peak, and it's amazing to watch. John, what do you think about the – sorry, Hoji. So the, the one crew I forgot to mention in my look who did better was the offensive line because we were giving them a lot of crap. How do you think – or John and Hoji, how do you think the offensive line performed? Like what did that look like in giving Burrow that cleaner pocket to throw from? Yeah, I think Jonah Williams and Ted Karras played fantastic in this yes. game. Um, the Falcons don't have a great pass rush necessarily. Like Grady Jarrett did all he could, and he had a couple of wins against Cordell Patterson. Uh, Al, or excuse me, Lyle Collins injured his ankle I think the middle of the game, and this is interesting. Two of the last three weeks, they've had a cumulative energy come in for an injured tackle at both left tackle and right tackle, and in both of those games, like they've scored on the drives that he's came in. Like he's had I think twenty or so pass blocking snaps. He's only allowed one pressure this is a guy that's been maligned and criticized constantly yeah. over the past three years because he's been put into these unfavorable situations whether it be at guard or just randomly in games and positions that he's not comfortable with he's now their swing tackle and i feel like he's completely settled down into that role behind an offensive line that really is starting to work together i think low collins is still not exactly 100 percent, and that just may not be the case for the rest of the year but the other four guys like they're completely gelled in and they're all assets to the team right now yeah and i will follow that up by saying look Every time this team wins, front page, Joe Burrow, offense, fine, I get it. Yeah, the offensive line was great. Joe Burrow's amazing. I get it, I get it, I get it. But there is a direct correlation on this team between the way our defense performs and when we win. It's our defense that has done the amazing things, I feel, that did the amazing things last year and that's doing amazing things this year. It's the fact that they, that the opposing team only scored 17, not just that we scored double that, right, or, or 35. So my, what's my point? My point is that when I think ahead to the Browns, John, I think ahead to Chubb and to that running game that is the defense's not weak point, but weaker point. It isn't our strong suit is against the run. It's not saying when, that the Bengals are bad against the run, but it's just that's not where they shine. And the Browns have always had our number. They have beat us when we really didn't expect them to. And I think it's because they are such an amazing running team. John, what do you think? It's kind of interesting how the Browns are coming right after the Falcons I feel like an extra day of game planning isn't almost it's, it's almost gonna be like a non-factor because I feel like the preparation is going to be very similar now the Browns run a different style of running attack compared to the Falcons like they're more under center they're more wide zone they're more some some power concepts they're pulling their guards and whatnot so they're doing a lot of different things with Chubb but the Bengals have yet to showcase that they can actually stop Nick Chubb and the, yeah. the fact that they've had great progress from both J. T. Fale and Zach Carter at defensive tackle. While DJ Reader has been on IR and DJ Reader is not going to play in this game, that's definitely been encouraging. And it's definitely one of the things that I think a lot of people are worried about this game. Like, how are they going to be able to stop Nick Chubb without their best defensive player? Maybe Logan Wilson coming back will, will help out with that. Just the overall communication and scraping over the top of some of those blocks. But like, they need to have the same type of plan of attack in this game. Like, get on top of the Browns early so they have to have Jacoby Brissett drop back 30, 40 times because if that happens. Browns have little to no shot. Right. So so prognosis grim for the Browns, even yeah. despite the fact that ch- we don't do well against Chubb. 
Well, I, I don't know, guys. Like, they have a 7% chance of making the playoffs. They're coming off of a three-point loss to a divisional team. They have no healthy players. Like, no. Bridget, like, this, this doesn't seem like it's going to be close. Nothing well, to lose, though. And what do you think about, like, Osai stepping up? Osai had his first sack ever? First sack yeah. of the season. Yeah. Whatever it was. First sack in the game yesterday. Like, John, you are spot on. Like, this defense is just stepping up. And even when guys go out... I think there's something really, really special about. Is this the Osai sack? Yeah. Oh, Whip, that's whipped just around beautiful. the edge there. Yeah. That's just beautiful to watch. Um, so, what do you like? What do you think is the key to stopping Chubb? Because I was writing my little notes to myself, and Chubb is one of my worries, and just how they come after. So, I think the Falcons only blitzed Burrow twice. Is that right? I feel yeah, like he was around there. Yeah. And so it, we saw what happens. You only blitz Burrow twice. You get 481 passing yards scored on you. So what do you think like the Browns are doing in their game planning right now? And we can talk about Osai, too, because that was pretty awesome. I, I think they had three sacks. They did, yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't specifically on blitzes. Like, sometimes their, their guys just won up front. And I think with the Browns, like... I, I don't feel like they're poorly coached necessarily. Like I think they they are well coached on offense, and that's been part of the problems with some of those games against the Bengals. But I, I think with the Browns, like the way they've been able to be successful, like their great players just end up playing great. Like Miles Garrett doesn't need help and any exotic no. p- pressures to beat the Bengals' offensive line. The way to stop Nick Chubb is to keep the ball out of his hands. I don't think there is a way to necessarily yeah. stop Nick Chubb. He's the best running back I've seen in a long time like generation he's just going to get his mm-hmm. so yeah. uh, the best way to stop him is to get on top of the browns early so that they don't have the chance to give him the ball unfortunately of, they just got to keep scoring a lot, of, a lot of browns fans john complain that they're passing too much considering how strong the running game is is that what do you think i mean is there a chance that yeah go ahead it certainly feels that way but i think if you look at the numbers in those obvious passing situations they're actually passing less than league average which which does make sense but when you have Nick Chubb and a well below average quarterback I think the perception is you need to run the ball 30 times because it's going to net to what five yards carry 150 yards and maybe that leads to win but it's not always that easy okay so let's get our predictions in John you want to go first oh you're leading to me <laughs> Well, you need to say a name after you say that, so... I think Daddy is experiencing a small revolt. Yeah. It's about yeah. time that happened. Well, that's that's what you get for running a daycare center in a place of business illegally, I might At add. least he got some music out of it. If anybody's watching, he, that is all totally under the table. Yeah. Well... We'll write now it out. Now it's out in the open. Um, yeah, I don't think the Browns are in a good place right now. I think on Monday Night Football in front of a national audience on Halloween, nonetheless. I, I, like don't think I don't think they're going to put up much of a fight, and they're just too banged up to really do much of anything. I don't think the Bengals are going to play necessarily great, but I do feel like there is some type of, of a motivational factor here. They haven't beaten the Browns in a significant game in a couple of years now. Like That, that probably means something to them. That's probably going to motivate them to make sure that they do this. So I'm going to say Bengals win more of a... It, let's just go like a modest, like a twenty-four to ten win. Twenty-four to ten, yeah, nice one. So that's similar to mine. I was gonna say twenty-four seventeen Bengals. Yeah. Um, I think we are hungry for a divisional win. I think after a really crap loss to the Steelers and a tough fight against the Ravens. We know we want to take the division, and we know we need to start figuring out how to break that tie. And I think they are coming for the Browns. I don't think we're going to see what we saw this week in terms of offensive production, but I think we come out with the W. So here's my prediction. Basically, you have to think about this psychologically. If you think about all of the Bengals' losses last year, there were times when we assumed they were going to win, like the Jets and stuff. The Bengals do best when someone doubts them. And what they sometimes do is create doubt during the game. Halloween is a day of masks. It's a day of not being yourself. I think the Bengals will not be themselves. They'll fall behind. The Browns will surprise people. They'll pull ahead. It'll be 24-24 tied until the very end of the game. We're going to overtime, and the Bengals will win it with a touchdown, 31-24. But it will not be an easy win. 
it will be a hard win and the Bengals will be reminded it will be a lesson in humility for the Cincinnati Bengals that is my hojoscope yeah I will say this I feel like that offensive line of the Browns has steamrolled us in the past and they will steamroll us this time as well you know we don't have DJ Reader in there and Joe Burrow you know we we tend to have this kind of team of Bengals players and coaches not performing the best against the franchises they loved as children Marvin Lewis with the Steelers and now Joe Burrow with the Cleveland Browns but I would say I think they will steamroll them to the tune of 31 to 17 Bengals and how is that steamroll because that sounds like opposite of obviously when you look really good right no, like you, you have you a very steam. ironed suit yeah you like got you got yeah exactly yeah they will you look steam, like they steam the clothing make it flat exactly. make it straight exactly they yeah. will look them like them look very snazzy yes a snazzy that is the word i was looking for yeah that is really bridget that is all that i have if that is all that you have that think that's where we can leave it. I did want to say, though, this was the first game that McPherson didn't attempt, hit, didn't have to attempt a field goal in his now, what, one year, seven game career with the Bengals. Can and I? I loved that. As much as I love a uh, shooter McPherson, Money Mac, long field goal, I love that we were scoring TDs instead of needing to kick a field goal. Can, can I can I say something not directly related, but something for the fans to understand? You might have heard earlier in the show we were talking about showing or not showing a clip. So the issue is when we show clips from the NFL on this show, it means we cannot use the show in certain contexts. So our our show, for example, won't be put on like a what is it like a national stream or something like that. Because best of belief, yeah, best, best of, of belief is on on yeah. all the local networks. So, so and if we I will be, yeah, yeah. So if I might, fans who are watching, could you in the YouTube comments tell us how important is it for you for us to show these clips as opposed to yeah. just describing them? You've probably watched the games. You can watch the highlights on your own, and we can just and describe them. I would like to know them, that. Let me ask them something else, and I don't want to give too well, much. You away. always put too much in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I just want to say, Definition if there is a extra. former Bengal you would like to see on the show, let us know about that as well. A former okay. Bengal that you would most like to see on the show. So, for, so now you've got two things to comment on the YouTube channel. But also, I want you to comment oh on if you are or are not a patron. And if you are not, explain yourself. And... If Daddy should do uppers before the show or downers, because I really feel like the ones that bring him down, bring our show down, you, you should have to do the uppers before the show, Daddy. And that's my hojoscope. Two. Two hojoscopes. Two hojoscopes. Bridget, what happened with your tickets this week? I feel like that was Yeah, there someone was stole your spot. What's up with that? Oh, uh, so I'm got to first off give a shout out to the ticket office who today spent a lot of time with me and are going to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Essentially, someone duplicated our tickets and sold them on StubHub. So the people had a legitimate... And they were... I have to say, I feel like I gave shade to the people in our seats. I mean, they had legitimate seats they probably paid a ton of money for on StubHub. The people were not disrespectful. So, so who do we hang? Who do we hang? Who we don't blame? hang anyone. Okay, who, I'm sorry. Who do we be? We, we hang the we hang the people who put your tickets on stuff up in the first place. Yeah, we hang that. When we're, we're never gonna. Okay, find describe them. them physically because Daddy has connections. He has mafia ties. I do, and I also want to ask my connections, all of you, to use your connections. Oh no, not another to YouTube get people comment. To leave a comment, and then also to go to Patreon.com/slash/DHSports and become a patron. And with that. <laughs> Daddy will be able to hire actual adults to work. Exactly. In his office. So yeah, so make sure to follow Bridget, the HR Jan Cuts, on Twitter. She's really on fire. Matilda! And Matilda! Make sure to follow Matilda. 
at Matilda underscore Ken. And yeah. you tell John what you want him to rap next week. And that's my hojoscope. We'll see you next time. So long. It's Fiti. Bye. There you go.